you know that thing of when someone says about someone who composes or choreographs or conceptualizes anything that they think outside the box? Well, when it comes to Matt Daly, there is no box. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. Figuratively, Matt's writing eviscerates convention in so many ways. Whether it's a novel and poems or stories from photographs or teaching students how to write comics that teach science. Matt's eager to be the only guy sitting in the shaded section of any Venn diagram he happens across. Literally, Matt is not one to be contained by a box. And by box, I mean anything remotely resembling a cube of any kind, whether it's an office or a house or a building of any sort, really. Matt writes about and is inspired by the natural world and is inspired more by a lemon, a missing finger, a snowdrift, a fence post, a deer's aimlessness than the mountains or the oceans. In addition to that, he truly cares about the craft of writing. He teaches composition and literature courses at Central Wyoming College's Jackson Outreach Center. He teaches creative writing to middle schoolers and high schoolers. He teaches writing to yoga instructors, sculptors, doctors, and scientists. He will collaborate with anyone to make something. His writing is inspired by nature and it describes the sense of wonder it instills in him. He writes about small towns and the fishing, gardening, deer, weeds, and cadence upon which those small towns rely and to which they must often resist. Matt is the author of the novel and poems called Between Here and Home, where he creates this whole fully realized astonishing world with the Campfire Tavern as its epicenter. Think Henry David Thoreau meets Sherwood Anderson for lunch, and lunch is smoked venison with Mary Oliver from a deer that Mary Oliver shot herself. In addition, a quick scroll through Matt's Instagram reveals that he not only writes books, he will write on anything. So without any further ado, here's Matt. Um, wow, I'm, Gary, thank you very much. That, that was really stunning. Um, and I promise not to show you the three foot cube of words that I made once. Um, um, that is the most literal box you could imagine. Um, no, thank you. Um, one of the great pleasures of being part of the unsolicited community and being involved in this reading is getting to meet Gary as a human being and as a writer. Um, and I'll say more about that in a little bit, but um, it's been a really wonderful experience. So thank you. Um, so I thought I'd read a few poems um, and my, my plan is to read this, the very first poem in the, in the collection that's called Characters, which really is like a cast of characters um, that helps set up the story. And then I thought I'd read the second section of the, of the collection. So um, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, the, the collection is a narrative that, uh, sort of lyrical narrative that is spoken in nine different voices um, in, set in a small town in the rural West. Um, and uh, secrets revealed when a character is um, in an accident on hits a deer on the way home from the campfire uh, tavern. Uh, and that secret sort of cascades out into the community as they think about the um, what they don't tell, basically, um, and might know about each other, but don't speak of. So um, the, the collection is a series of soliloquies. So the first poem will be characters. Um, and then you'll hear their, some of their names in the titles of the, of the other poems. Um, and I probably won't talk very much in between them. So there we go. Um, characters, Pam, late thirties, not yet an alcoholic, but she's on her way. Never told anyone but the warden himself that she was once pregnant with his child. Drives herself home from the campfire tavern regardless of her condition. Birdie, ghost of Skylar's mother, loves to dance. Bev, 
owner of the Campfire Tavern, Bertie's lifelong friend, skeptical of newcomers and some old timers. Skylar, early 20s, Bertie's son, an addict, knows more than he lets on. Russ, Skylar's father, unacknowledged, keeps his distance from Skylar at Bertie's request, keeps his chest pains to himself, sometimes with Janie, a fisherman. Janie, sculptor, artist, sometimes with Russ, an observer. Richard, retired doctor, inherited the ranch once belonging to his wife, unnamed, when she died with no other heir. Buddy, old friend of Russ, Bev, and Bertie, drives himself home from the diversion dam, regardless of his condition. The warden, Pam's lover before he left town, the stranger. Deer, here before the town, casualties. River, unobstructed from its source until the dam east of town diverts most of the water for irrigation. Wind, unobstructed or at least indifferent to obstructions. Highway, a danger to those crossing and to those following its passage. So from part two, Bev finds the ultrasound. Pam's little place was tidier than I expected. How white she kept the walls, how light fell through window panes to her side table, her polished stones. House plants needed water, so I watered them. On the sill in her bedroom, I watered them, plucked a yellow leaf or two. I saw it when I sought a place to put the leaves, a book for her to read, a snapshot to look at as she learned about life with those dead legs. Nightstand drawer slid open like it was waxed inside a white figure curled in a black bowl. Where did she put that shape once growing inside her? When did she choose a life with the child removed? I held up that lone image, Pam's baby in one hand, tin watering can loose in the other. Sunshine lit a glass of water full of little bubbles. After I closed the empty drawer, I went to the store to buy her magazines to ask if anyone remembered. Russ remembers his first close call. I used to drive fast all the time, faster drinking. I was with Bertie and Bev the first time it cost me headed back from the Palmer place. Last time Bev let Bertie bring me to the family homestead, Bev used to think the old place was all right for drinking. Used to be we all agreed. My old sedan, the kind of deal I could pick up off rodeo cowboys before all their hard luck drained into the night, hit a rut wrong on a rise. We lifted delicate as dubbing and hackle swung in a tight loop over a river scene. Worn out shocks gave such a softness to the ride. None of us noticed we had left the ground until we hit it again. All three of us in the front seat, behind us the empty night we were always running from. Headlights shot wild at horizon, gravel, sky. Back then, if you landed upright and nothing was broken, you put it back in gear. None of us knew Bertie had my boy inside her. This is Skylar's tooth. It's not a baby tooth, just one no other pushed out of my head. Dentist called it an eye tooth, said he'd cap it to look like all the rest. Mom called it a reminder, but never did say of what. When she got sick, I thought I looked tough, sucking my tongue through the space it made. Kids learned quick what they'd get for pointing out the gap that showed the odd times I'd smile. Mom made Russ go fish with me to talk tough and trouble. He showed me his bridge, all those teeth fake in his mouth, like we shared some secret. Russ said he'd come close to the edge, his eyes flashed like mine. I thought about a bridge for my bottom teeth I've lost this year. I get tired of Bev saying I look just like mom. Now that she's underneath, I'm nobody's baby. not a very cheerful town. Um, Buddy has words with Skylar. You look like your mother, I tell him, whenever I see him up here or down lower by the KOA. What's it to you, bud? 
not knowing he uses my name. There's nothing to it, I want to say, to him, but never do. Not a goddamn thing to it. Just an observation I thought you might like, you stupid son of a bitch. But I do not say that, or anything more than never mind. I just like to think of her when I see him. Thought he might want to think of her. Well, bud, you look like a fucking raven with that shiny can gripped in your claw. Him sitting there on a cement table at the rest stop across the parking lot from the diversion dam. You're right about that boy, I say, as I take a long pull from the can. Who you call him boy? He goes red. So I fix him with that black eyed stare I learned from Russ, but folks in town think must be on account of something Indian. You boy, that's what I'm calling you. Before the evening gets away from us, the highway patrol cruiser swoops in black and chases us both away. I feel like I run into him less and less since those others showed up around the campground since it got too wild down there for me. My stump finger aches whenever I do see him. Every time I think of her when I see him. Uh, this next one is titled What Pam Knows. Pam is the person who was injured in this accident and her recovery is sort of the, mm, well, one of the central threads to the narrative um, of the collection. What Pam Knows. The way Bev worried her bottom lip that first afternoon, the way she bent to place the magazines by my bedside, I knew she knows. Even then, I would not pretend I was sleeping. These days, she brings yellow tulips from the grocery. Each time, she ties them up with a ribbon of a different color, never red or white. In some of the tulips, little black beetles scale the pistol. Maybe she thinks I want to fill my emptiness. Each visit, there is a moment when I think, here it comes. But then, nothing, just a pause in her breathing. She won't tell me. She doesn't need to say a word. So she knows about the baby, what I chose in a different life when I had a life from the waist down. At least I know she can keep a woman's secret if she cares to, the way she keeps fallen leaves off Bertie's grave. At least I know how over Bertie's secret, Russ and that boy, she can still bend down deep and low. Um, the next poem is in the voice of the deer, which was kind of the challenge I enjoyed the most when writing this book is how to try to give voice to a non-human speaker. Um, deer have a mineral hunger. Hiss of river under wind, hiss of movement on ground too hard for earth. New grass under pelt grass, summer fattens, spots away. New green under severed stems, we risk against cold. Wolves never speak of these killers, these eaters, we would not believe them if they spoke to us of killers like these. Sunrise killers spew minerals under flat haunches without tails, we explode before them. Black birds pick us apart, start anus, start eye. I'll just read three more. Um, Russ fishes the oxbow. By their choice or mine, they come and go. Like birds on wavelets, birds near the eddy's edge, mallard, merganser, oozel, gadwall. Some dip under, all rise eventually gone to air. I watch a kingfisher from where I stand in the back eddy, slack water, behind this boulder where I once tried to carve her name. Kingfishers cut through currents to minnows underneath, spear them with their beaks. Birdie stood once where I stand now, pulled three fish too big for an osprey to carry, much less a kingfisher, rainbow, cutthroat, brown, laughter, and her singing reel. Kingfishers laugh more often than they sing. Some days I bring myself here to where currents work away at where they touch rock, carvings I made on the stone surface growing smooth. Some days I don't even bother to string the rod I bring down from the truck, my gesture to the water birds, to the kingfisher perched on her power line, always with me, needed or no. Janie finds her materials. 
Russ knows I combed the cemetery grove for leaves edged like feathers, a deer's jawbone today. I tell him I saw Bev there. She is never too busy with Birdie's gravestone to notice or with her eyes to opine. After dusk, I tell Russ how Bev brushed away snow with her ungloved hand. I tell him about the moon, cottonwood, gleam, and owl. His eyebrows twitch when he smiles at these worlds we live beside. Russ stands in my bedroom doorway, knee deep in pursuit of shadows on the riverbed. Banks rhymed with the waning night's jetsam. He knows what gifts I seek in rafts of clouds, why I look to fill our unmapped spaces. And I'll close with one more poem from Bev. I think I chose this section because Gary mentioned that he likes Bev. So she's in this one twice. Um, so here's Bev remembers cranes. Summers we search for hatchlings, no taller than seed heads in tall grass along the spring bottom. I knew why you searched for them, how you knew father cranes watched over chicks as their downs left away, how gray flight feathers followed brown. You could tell mothers from fathers, there was some small difference you never shared that made you certain which parent strode patiently before us, croaked its alarm whenever one of us cracked a stick beneath our feet. Could you still spot the offspring even after their feathers grew long enough, gray enough to carry their grown bodies out of sight past downy summer clouds? We lived with their migration. For them, our place was a nesting place. Thanks. This was a, an exciting turn of events to get to meet Gary and to, to read the, the upcoming novel um, that'll be out mid-month, Kissing the Roadkill Back to Life, um, and to just discover a new favorite. Um, I can say some biographical things about Gary that are, that are in the chat and um, that I, I know, but I, that's the main thing I wanted to say is that this is a, a writer who I couldn't wait to get home to read. Um, I rushed through my work to get back in time um, to keep write, reading the novel. Um, and so how fortunate that I also have the memoir, The Emperor Ice, Ice Cream, to dive into next. Um, so it's really been a pleasure. Um, a few biographical details. Um, Gary has a dog named Dave that he cares about um, much. Um, and a close, a keen observation for the Jersey Shore. Um, he's a attorney and writer in Baltimore, Maryland, um, where he lives with his family. Um, and has written extensively uh, fiction, nonfiction. There are some brilliant, funny pieces in McSweeney's uh, internet tendency that are worth tracking down. Um, and like I say, I think what I was most touched by in this novel, uh, it was quite moving. And I love that, um, I love Gary's ability to write with great humor and great care for the people that he's imagined. Um, I thought that that blend of um, sharp humor and deep care uh, was deeply moving to me. And especially uh, in a time now that I have to inhabit the world of his work, um, I was grateful for. So Gary, I'm excited to hear you tonight. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, this, my first novel, it's called Kissing the Roadkill Back to Life. The title comes from a poem by Ross Gay called To My, to my Child, If Ever You Shall Be. And um, writers are really lucky because we get to just do whatever we want, you know? Like there's no budgets, there's no concern about uh, special effects or, you know, lasers or going to outer space or whatever. So, um, and we're lucky also because, you know, we can think of a story and you know sleep on it and then if it goes away it's like oh that wasn't much of a story but if it doesn't go away it's like oh we have to you know we have to dive into this we have to um do this so um 
I mean, for decades, I've kind of wondered <laughs> what would happen or what would have happened had uh, JFK Jr. had a child. And it's, um, you know, it's, I guess it's, you know, historical fiction, you know, you can manufacture Abraham Lincoln doing anything, you can, you know, manufacture George Washington doing anything. So um, manufacturing JFK Jr. got to, um, I got to spend some time in the 80s, which was fun. I got to humanize somebody who, and he comes from a time where being famous was different than it is today. You know, there were only, it seemed like there were only like seven or eight famous people in, in the 1980s, you know, and, you, and despite the fact they were famous, you didn't know anything about them. So uh, humanizing a person with like, you know, details and, and that was, was a lot of fun, as well as just, you know, imagining, um, uh, you know, just, hey, who is this kid that JFK Jr. may or may not have known that he had? Um, so I will start, and also we get to like, we get to manufacture names. We get to you know the, the epigraphs of a of a novel are so much fun. I wish you know you you could just manufacture like name titles and epigraphs for books, and then um, you know write the book later or something. But here's the first chapter after a lengthy prologue. Um, the mother of JFK Jr.'s child is named Gloria, and we meet her um, when, she's, when she's younger. Butterfield 8. Her first name was Gloria, a name to which she could never quite get accustomed. It often seemed to her that her parents had someone else in mind when they named her. Gloria, to her mind, was a name better suited to someone either impossibly pious or comically provocative. Gloria, the name, was both sultry and celestial, both angelic and lurid, both sacrosanct and seductive. It was Jim Morrison's too fast, G-L-O-R-I-A, in The Doors is Gloria, and the too slow, Gloria, of every church choir's angels we have heard on high. It was the name of and for someone perpetually stuck between two worlds, dipping proverbial toes into both without ever fully committing to either. This lack of cohesion was likely because her parents did have someone else in mind when they named her. Her parents named her after Elizabeth Taylor character in Butterfield 8, which they had seen two nights before she was born on November 28, 1960. Her last name was Winnegar, a name of German origin, and she hailed from good, hearty, corn-fed, upstate New York stock. She lived in the same house from the day she was born until the day she moved to Providence, save for the two years she spent living on campus at Syracuse University, where her mother worked as a secretary. Homer was as small as towns got. It had precisely one elementary school, one middle school, and one high school. It had two gas stations, one car wash, one deli, an ice cream place, and the typical panoply of small shops, which housed the auto mechanic, the welder, the upholsterer, the undertaker, some clergy, and the purveyor of lumber and hardware goods. It was a child's concept of a town, as though he or she had built it from scratch from Lego. Everything you needed to live, if your idea of living was more like subsisting than reveling in each brand new day. She was one of 5,955 Glorias born in the United States in 1960, making it that year's 79th most popular girl's name. Her father, a genuinely good and kind man, but simultaneous, simultaneously human nonetheless, and therefore generally powerless to be anything but human, flawed, carnivorous, reptilian at times, short-sighted, astonishing, astounding human, was smitten with Elizabeth Taylor, which seemed developmentally appropriate for a newly married 22-year-old young man in 1960. He was terrified of parenthood and just one generation from an era when women were scarcely permitted to open bank accounts, did his very best being a husband and raising children. 
Gloria's middle name was Hyacinth, chosen by her mother with neither input nor any threat of veto from Gloria's father. One of the negotiations of a marriage. Hyacinth was Gloria's maternal grandmother's name, a woman Gloria deeply loved. Hyacinth, as her name might suggest, loved flowers and knitting and crocheting and needlepoint and all things dainty. Gloria's parents were called Dave and Connie. Dave's parents were farmers and he worked at the Smith Corona typewriter factory in Portland about 10 miles, about 10 minutes south of Homer. Connie's parents were also farmers. She and Dave met in high school and married soon thereafter. Connie stayed home to raise Gloria and her sister Peggy and her brother Dave Jr. until Dave Jr. was in school and she took a job as a secretary at Syracuse University. Naming a girl after someone synonymous with glamour will not necessarily or inevitably make that girl glamorous. Glory was not glamorous insofar as glamour might be synonymous with sophistication and elegance or magnetism and fashionableness, which is not to say that she was unattractive, quite the opposite. She was merely attractive in a no makeup, flowy sundress and sandals or blue jeans and sweatshirts, sort of non-Elizabeth Taylor kind of way. She had almond eyes, which alternated between grayish green and brownish gray, and which sat appealingly and deeply on the perimeter of a round freckled face. Freckles that might simultaneously say, these freckles make me sexy, or these freckles make me a tomboy who has spent way too much time in the sun, likely playing beach volleyball with boys bigger than me. She was always tall for her age and when she stopped growing would be five foot 10 and typically wore her chestnut hair in a short pixie-ish cut. She fancied herself a confident person. She was determined, smarter than most and nonchalant to the point of something resembling apathy with regard to appearance. She was athletic, played sports in high school. There was no shortage of suitors in high school or college and she lost her virginity under appropriate circumstances at an appropriate age and navigated the world of dating with a plum. Her confidence helped with this. She was fortunate to have a grandmother who fostered this, fostered this confidence. Hyacinth once, once told her, should a person take his or her thumbnail and scratch anyone's surface aggressively enough or just long enough, one would surely find that the least attractive person in the world would have, with a little tweaking, the capacity to be beautiful, while even the most beautiful among us have, just a few minor adjustments or unforeseen circumstances or minor deprivations, the potential to be among our ugliest. Of this she was certain, and that certainly wended its way into Gloria's mind. And I'll fast forward to page 166, and Gloria is in Providence in the 1980s, and she is dating, sorry. Dating after likely having JFK Jr.'s child. <laughs> um, this is called Sowing the Seeds of Love. Gloria was in the grocery store when she saw a People magazine with JFK Jr. on the cover. The magazine identified him as the sexiest man alive. She knew there would be a day like this. She did not know that he would ever be identified as the sexiest man alive, but she had known or suspected there would be a day where he would be lauded or heralded or otherwise celebrated for something, and she would be merely an observer. That the natural progression of his public life, his persona, that started at commencement would inevitably lead to a public life more, well, public. She had also learned, was certain of it, despite what she thought of as her ineptitude in most things associated with life, that it was possible to feel multiple emotions at the, simultaneously and that the feeling of one did not diminish the other. She experienced many emotions when she saw him on the cover of People Magazine's heralded Sexiest Man Alive issue. She was giddy. Was that an emotion? She thought so. I feel giddy. She was happy. She felt sad for him, knowing that he would find such a proclamation classless, unrefined, and the attention unwarranted, and that such attention might be directed elsewhere. 
She was not ashamed that she was proud that they were once intimate. She was a little turned on even. She remembered fondly what those weeks with him were like. Presumably he had not suffered the same dearth of intimacy from which she had suffered since 1983. Suffered's the wrong word here. She was content being solo, wasn't she? She wasn't suffering. She was enjoying her time alone. She was also a little angry that she couldn't tell people about their intimacy. She dated a guy who liked to get high and listen to Tears for Fears before they went out. Gloria, as she learned, was happy to try anything once. So she tried getting high and listening to Tears for Fears. She understood the multi-layered synthesizers and sounds of Tears for Fears could be considered interesting while high, but it just wasn't her thing. She was not surprised at how picky she was, but she was surprised at the things she identified as deal breakers. She went on a date with a guy who wore a too tight turtleneck that showed his nipples, a date with a guy who used the end of his fork to scratch an itch on his cheek while eating his Caesar salad. A guy who could do all the Oak Ridge Boys voices while he sang along to Elvira. A guy with a, they will get my gun when they pull my cold dead finger off the trigger bumper sticker on his car. A guy who wore a Rubik's Cube sweatshirt on their date. A guy who finished her entree. A guy who had four beers at dinner. She went on a date with a guy who shushed her when Eddie Murphy's party all the time came on the radio. She looked at him and said, this isn't gonna work. Turn the car around and take me home. She was proud of this, proud of this courage. Getting shushed was one thing, getting shushed so a guy could listen to a six minute song with the same verse over and over again was quite another. She went on a date with a guy who had seen Top Gun more than three dozen times and told her, if things go well, we can go home and watch it on my big screen TV. She wanted to ask him if things went really, really well, if they could play volleyball on the beach wearing dungarees, but figured such passive aggressive teasing would have gone right over his head, like a Navy fighter jet driven by the Iceman. Or piloted? Jets are piloted, not driven, she thought to herself, as she tried to mentally escape the date that she was on. Again, she was encouraged by this. She was getting it better. She was getting better at dating, it seemed, despite all the duds. The fact that she still had standards, that she could still voice those standards, that she was still herself, and that she could still hope for more, or someone she liked. Guys are crazy, she told Ruth, after one of these dates. We're crazy too, Ruth replied. Well, everyone's crazy then. And I'll stop there, if that 